Okay, we're reading Strangers in the Fog. As you're reading, use your dialectical journal to annotate for <coughs> signposts. So you're going to put your quote on the left-hand side under evidence <coughs> and your signposts on your right-hand side under reactions or whatever reactions you want to put. Hannigan had just finished digging the grave down in the toll marsh where the little saltwater creek flowed toward the Pacific, when the dark shape of a man came out of the fog. Startled, Hannigan brought the shovel up and cocked it, weapon-like, at his shoulder. The other man had materialized less than twenty yards away from the direction of the beach and stopped the moment he saw Hannigan. The diffused, direction of, the diffused light of, from Hannigan's lantern did not quite reach the man, he was a black silhouette against the swirling billows of mist. Beyond him, the breakers lashed at the hidden shore in the sh steady pulse. Hannigan said, Who are you? The man stood staring down at the roll of canvas near Hannigan's feet, at the hole scooped out of the sandy earth. He seemed to poise himself on the balls of his feet, body turned slightly, as though he might bolt at any second. I'll ask you the same question, he said and his voice was tense, low-pitched. I happen to live here, Hannigan made a gesture to his left with the shovel, where a suggestion of shimmery light shone high up through the fog. This is a private beach. Private graveyard, too? My dog died earlier this evening. I didn't want to leave him lying around the house. Must have been a pretty big dog. He was a Great Dane, Hannigan said. He wiped moisture from his face with his free hand. You want something, or you just like to take strolls in the fog? Then the man came forward a few steps, warily. Hannigan could see him clearly then in the pale lantern glow. Big, heavy-shouldered, damp hair flattened across his forehead, wearing a plaid lumberman's jacket, brown slacks, and loafers. You got a telephone I can use? That would depend on why you need to use it. I could give you a story about my car breaking down, the big man said, but then you'd just wonder what I'm doing here instead of up on the coast highway. I'm wondering that anyway. It's safe down here, the way I figure it. I don't follow, Hannigan said. Don't you listen to the radio or TV? Not if I can avoid it. So you don't know about the lunatic who escaped from the state asylum at Tescadero. The back of Hannigan's neck prickled. No, he said. Happened late this afternoon, the big man said. He killed an attendant at the hospital, stabbed him with a kitchen knife. He was the, in there for the same kind of thing. Killed three people with a kitchen knife. Hannigan did not say anything. The big man said, they think he may have headed north because... He came from a town up near or the Oregon border. But they're not sure. He may have come south instead, and Tescadero is only 12 miles from here. Hannig Hannigan gripped the handle of his shovel more tightly. You still haven't said what you're doing down here in the fog. I came up from San Francisco with a girl for the weekend, the big man said. Her husband was supposed to be in Los Angeles on business, only I guess he decided to come home early. When he found her gone, he must have figured she'd come up to this summer place they've got, and she, so he drove up without calling first. We had just enough warning for her to throw me out. You let this woman throw you out? That's right. Her husband is worth a million or so, and he's generous. You understand? Maybe, Hannigan said. What's the woman's name? That's my business. Then how do I know you're telling the truth? Why wouldn't I be? You might have a re you might have reasons for lying. Like if it was the if it was a, if I was an escaped lunatic maybe like that. If I was, would I have told you about him? Again, Hannigan was silent. For all I know, the big man said, you could be the lunatic. Shoot, you're the one out here digging a grave in the middle of the night. I told you my dog died. Besides, would a lunatic dig a grave for somebody he killed? 
Did he dig one for the attendant you said he stabbed? Okay, neither one of us is the lunatic. The big man paused and ran his hands along the side of his coat. Look, I've had enough of this fog. It's starting to get to me. Can I use your phone or not? Just who is it that you want to call? Friend of mine in San Francisco who owes me a favor. He'll drive up and get me. That is, if you wouldn't mind me hanging around your place until he shows up. Hannigan thought things over and made up his mind. All right, you stand over there while I finish putting Nick away. Then we'll go up. The big man nodded and stood without moving. Hannigan knelt, still gasping, still grasping the, straighten, the shovel and rolled the canvas-wrapped body carefully into the grave. Then he straightened, began to scoop in sandy earth from the pile to one side. He did all of that without taking his eyes off of the other man. When he was finished, he picked up the lantern, then gestured with the shovel, and the big man came around the grave. They went up along the edge of the creek, Hannigan four or five steps to the left. The big man kept his hands up and in close to, and in close to his chest, and he walked with the tense, springy stride of an animal prepared to attack or flee at any sudden movement. His gaze hung on Hannigan's face. Hannigan made it reciprocal. You have a name? Hannigan asked him. Doesn't everybody? Very funny. I'm asking you your name. Art Vickery, if it matters. It doesn't, except that I like to know who I'm letting inside my house. I like to know who's, whose house I'm going into, Vickery said. Hannigan told him. After that, neither of them had anything more to say. The creek wound away to the right after 50 yards, into a tangle of scrub brush, sage, and tall grass. To the left and straight ahead were the low, rolling sand dunes, and behind them the earth became hard-packed and rose sharply into the bluff on which the house had been built. Hannigan took Vickery onto the worn path between two of the dunes. Fog massed around them in wet gray swirls shredding as they passed through it, then re-knitting again at their backs. Even with the lantern, visibility was less than 30 yards in any direction. Although, as they neared the bluff, his house lights threw out a progressively brighter illumination against the screen of mist. They were halfway up the winding path before the house itself loomed into view, a huge red wooden glass structure with a wide balcony facing the sea. The path ended at a terraced patio, and there were wooden steps at the far end that led up alongside the house. When they reached the steps, Hannigan gestured for Vickery to go up first. The big man did not argue, but he ascended sideways, looking back down at Hannigan, neither of his hands touching the railing. Hannigan followed by four of the wood runners. At the top, in the front of the house, was a parking area and a small garden. The access road that came in from the coast highway and the highway itself were invisible in the misty darkness. The light over the door burned dully as Vickery moved toward it, and Hannigan shut off the lantern and put it, in, it and the shovel down against the wall. Then he started after the big man. He was just about to tell Vickery that the door was unlocked and to go in when another man came out of the fog. Hannigan saw immediately over on the access road and stopped with his back, back of his neck prickling again. This newcomer was about the same size as Vickery, and Hannigan himself, thick through the body, dressed in a rumpled suit but without a tie. He had wildly unkempt hair and an air of either agitation or harried intent. He hesitated briefly when he saw Hannigan and Vickery. Then he came toward them, holding his right hand against his hip at a spot covered by his suit jacket. Vickery had seen him by this time, and he was up on the balls of his feet again, nervously watchful. The third man halted opposite the door and looked back and forth between Hannigan and Vickery. He said, one of you the owner of this house? I am, Hannigan said. He gave his name. 
Who are you? Lieutenant McLean, Highway Patrol. You been here all evening, Mr. Hannigan? Yes. No trouble of any kind? No. Why? We're looking for a man who escaped from the hosp hospital at Tescadero this afternoon, McLean said. Maybe you've heard about him. Hannigan nodded. Well, I don't want to alarm you, but we've had word that maybe in, he may be in this vicinity. Hannigan wet his lips and glanced at Vickery. If you're with the highway patrol, Vickery said to McLean, how come you're not in uniform? I'm an investigate. I'm in investigation, plain clothes. Why would you be on foot and alone? I thought the police always traveled in pairs. McLean frowned and studied Vickery for a long moment, penetratingly. His eyes were wide and dark and did not blink much. At length, he said, I'm alone because we've had to spread ourselves thin in order to cover this whole area, and I'm on foot because my car came up with a broken fan belt. I radioed for assistance, and then I came down here because I didn't see any sense in sitting around waiting and doing nothing. Hennigan remembered Vickery's words on the beach. I could give you a story about my car breaking down. He wiped again at the dampness on his face. Vickery said, you mind if we see some identification? McLean took his hand away from his hip and produced a leather folder from his inside jacket pocket. He held it out so Hannigan and Vickery could read it. That satisfy you? The folder corroborated, corroborated what McLean had told them about himself, but it did not contain a picture of him. Vickery said nothing. Hannigan said, asked, have you got a photo of this lunatic? None that will do us any good. He destroyed his file before he escaped from the asylum, and he's been in there 16 years. The only pictures we could dig up were so old, that he's and he's apparently changed so much that people at Tescadero tell us there's almost no likeness anymore. What about a description? Big, dark-haired, regular features, no deformities or identifying marks. That could fit any one of a hundred thousand men or more in Northern California. It could fit any one of the three of us, Vickery said. McLean studied him again. That's right, it could. Is there anything else about him, Hannigan asked. I mean, could he pretend to be sane and get away with it? The people at the hospital say yes. That makes it even worse, doesn't it? You bet it does, McLean said. He rubbed his hands together. Look! Why don't we talk inside? It's pretty cold out here. <clears throat> Hannigan hesitated and wondered if McLean had some other reason for wanting to go inside. And when he looked at Vickery, it seemed to him the other man was wondering the same thing. But he could see no way to refuse without making trouble. He said, no, I guess not. The door's open. For a moment, all three of them stood motionless, McLean still watching Vickery intently. Vickery had begun to fidget under the scrutiny. Finally, since he was closest to the door, he jerked his head away, opened it, and went in sideways, the same way he'd climbed the steps from the patio. McLean kept on waiting, which left Hannigan no choice except to follow Vickery. When they were both inside, McLean entered and shut the door. The three of them went down a short hallway into the big, beam-ceilinged family room. McLean glanced around at the fieldstone field fireplace, the good reproductions on the walls, the tasteful modern furniture. Furnishings. Nice place, he said. You live here alone, Mr. Hannigan? No, with my wife. Is she here now? She's in Vegas. She likes to gamble, and I don't. I see. Can I get you something? A drink? Thanks, no. Nothing while I'm on duty. I wouldn't mind having one, Vickery said. He was still fidgeting because McLean was still watching him and had been the entire time he was talking to Hannigan. Near the picture window that took up the entire wall facing the ocean was a leather-topped standing bar. Hannigan crossed to it. The drapes were open and wisps of the gray fog outside pressed against the glass like skeletal fingers. 
He put his back to the window and lifted a bottle of bourbon from one of the shelves. Inside the bar.